welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the ANA eLearning Academy. During this presentation, um, if you come up with any questions, you are muted. So please be sure that um, you can type those questions into the chat box at the bottom or the Q&A um, section. Um, and then at the end, uh, Bob, if it's okay with you, we can take any questions at the end. Yes, that'd be preferred. Thank okay. you. Okay, um, so now I'd like to introduce you to our presenter for the day. Robert Bob Bear has been involved in numismatics since 1956, first as a collector and then as a coin dealer, starting in 1987. As a boy growing up in northwestern Wisconsin in the 50s, he began collecting coins that he received from his newspaper route and a lifelong passion was born. Um, he holds a master's degree in U.S. history and educational administration, and Bob is pre presenting today lives joined in genius, Laura Garden Frazier and James Earl Frazier. And Bob, if you want to go ahead and click your share screen button. Okay. And then and pull that. up your PowerPoint. All right. I, I guess we're cooking, huh? Uh-huh. And then click from beginning. Oh, yeah. OK, back to the And then slide. you'll have that whole screen. Yep. And then I'm going to turn my camera off and mute myself so you have the whole floor. Oh, boy. But I'm here. If <laughs> you need you, me, Paula. if you need me, just ask. Yeah. I'll be, I'm right here. So, sounds wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Paula, for, of course. for your help. Yep. Welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, Thanks to Paula for the nice introduction, but even more thanks to all of you uh, for joining to find out some things about two absolutely talented and wonderful people. Uh, of course, they're involved with numismatics. They, they did some coin design, as we'll see, but there's so much more to these people than that. Uh, and it would be an injustice to them if I didn't introduce you guys to some of the incredible things that they did uh, in art and the, their form was sculpture and uh, medallic art and so on. Uh, but I also want to introduce you to them as they were just a wonderful couple. They were totally in love, married for almost exactly 40 years uh, and uh, uh, just devoted to one another. And there's a neat story in that as well. But I also have to tell you how I discovered them. Um, I I write uh, occasional articles for the numismatist and so on. And I got to thinking, uh, gee, I wonder if there's something on James Earl Frazier uh, that hasn't been covered. Uh, and I really didn't know much about Laura then, but I thought I got to find out what primary materials, original materials there are for at least James, if not Laura. Uh, it turns out they're all the personal items are uh, kept at the uh, National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City, which is not that far from where I live in Denver. So it was a little difficult to do. I persuaded my wife, uh, who was still working and I was retired, hey, Connie, uh, let's take a research field trip to Oklahoma City and dig around in uh, undigitalized primary materials for James Earl Frazier and yeah, his wife, Laura, as well. Well, it was a hard sell, but finally we got to go. We went down there. We were the first people since 1968 to go into the Frazier uh, archives, which were basically eight gigantic cardboard moving boxes, four feet tall, uh, you know, two feet by two feet uh, at the top, full of folders. They kind of been organized uh, by decade, more or less, but there were just all sorts of materials. Uh, and Connie and I spent three days, 10 hours a day, uh, just going through all these boxes to see what was there. And uh, as we went along, we learned more and more about the Frasers and frankly, Laura in particular, who left more materials. She kept diaries every year of her life uh, and didn't intend obviously for anyone to read them while she was alive, but she died in 1966. And as I read them, I felt I really got to know her. Remarkable person. Her Jimmy was a remarkable person. And let's get going. Uh, we'll find out a whole lot more about both of them as a result of that research field trip to Oklahoma City. Uh, here's a picture of the two of them, uh, a good picture of both and indicates uh, really their, uh, their, their bond uh, as artists, but even more so uh, as a couple in love. And it's being presented by me, obviously. 
let's go to the uh, first slide. Here we go. Um, the quotation from Edith Hamilton at the bottom, she'd written a great book on mythology, I thought was so appropriate uh, to introduce uh, James and Laura, a path we never thought to tread God found for us. So this has come to pass. The path was, was one another, yes, but it was art. It was their talent, their genius, and how it would be expressed. They walked the path side by side as each found his and her uh, niche and his and her expression. Who are these people? Well, incredibly talented sculptors, medallic artists, designers of some of the most beautiful and memorable coins ever. Uh, and that's appropriate for our topic today. They must have been related, huh? Yeah, married for 40 years, totally in love. Uh, and it was fun to find that out, the depth of their relationship. Uh, they were, their life, their lives was the art they did but it also was each other. They inspired each other and everybody that saw their work for about half a century, they were really uh, in, incredibly prominent, deservedly so, in the first half of the 20th century. And my hopes, hope in this presentation is that you'll become acquainted with some of the marvelous things they did. And that just as I feel these two have, have become my friends, even though they've been dead for decades, that they'll be your friends too. Did they accomplish a lot? Sure, they did literally hundreds of sculptures, medals, and coin designs. Uh, and we're gonna, we are not going to see all hundreds of them, but we'll see many. <laughs> uh, well, this was their life. There's nothing but art. Art is living. And living is art for, for these two. Uh, just remarkable. Uh, and what a happy and uh, fulfilling life. Uh, they found with each other, yes, but in their art as well. How about Laura? Let's start with her. Uh, born 18, uh, 89, died of a stroke in 1966. Her mom was artistic and had three daughters. Uh, the mom encouraged all three of them in art, starting with modeling and clay, and it especially found a niche in Laura. Uh, she realized, even as a kid, that art was her going to be her life, that she had art in her that had to come out. Well, all right, she went to Columbia after she graduated from high school. She joined, naturally, the Art Students League. She had James Earl Frazier as a teacher. <clears throat> he was 13 years older than she was, uh, but she worked together with him. It was all legitimate, uh, but they f ended up falling in love, and they married uh, in 1913. Uh, and were uh, just a happy, wonderfully happy couple until uh, Jimmy died in 1953. Uh, what did Laura do? All kinds of large sized, called heroic sculptures, uh, when they're absolutely monumental in size, all kinds of commissioned medals, and yes, some coin designs, uh, commemorative half dollars in particular for Laura. Uh, she was a woman in a male-dominated, male-male-dominated field, male chauvinistic era. Uh, but her talent was so pronounced and obvious, and her determination uh, was such that she found a niche in spite of the handicaps that uh, uh, society uh, tended to place on women at that time. Jimmy, and here, here's a, a shot of Laura as a young artist, uh, probably shortly after uh, she married Jimmy. Jimmy and I had standing jokes between us. One of them was when I finished a job and it was presented, we would wager as to how long it would be before someone would comment to me, hey, bet Mr. Frazier helped you on this one. One time in fun, I snapped back at a wealthy patron. Uh, just who is this James Earl Frazier I keep hearing about? <laughs> a good comeback, Laura. <laughs> Mother, whom we affectionately called Neo, was both a talented painter and musician. She taught us girls and encouraged us to study the arts. And it sure found a, a niche and a place uh, in, in daughter Laura. Oh, this is Laura in old age. She's standing. You can just see a part of uh, the Oklahoma land rush uh, work that was commissioned to Jimmy. Uh, but 
he died before it was completed. She knew his style and finished finished it off. It was mostly done, uh, but she finished it off a bit. Uh, but here's Laura. This is a tribute from uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, Ulysses, uh, that so applies uh, to Laura. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days mo moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will. To strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. That was Laura all her life. The year following our marriage, Laura recalled, we bought property in Westport. That's Westport, Connecticut, which then became uh, a major uh, kind of an artistic center. All kinds of art people flocked there, uh, in starting uh, with the Frasers, but then continuing because of their influence. Our home was colonial in origin, and we could date it back more than 200 years. Then we built our studio in the center of 40 acres. We designed it for our future together. They each had half of this building. We'll see a slide of it later. It was 30 feet by 60 feet and a story and a half high. Big as it was, we kept it full most of the time. We loved it. They did. That was their life. Here's Laura at work. On uh, She was commissioned by Baltimore in uh, nine, around 1936 uh, to do Here's heroic sculpture to do statues of Generals Lee and Jackson. Baltimore was an interesting city during the Civil War. Um, lots of Southern sentiment in Baltimore, let's say. And that had, to some extent, had to do with a uh, desire to um, have statues of Lee uh, and, and Jackson. Uh, those statues uh, in, in our day and age, uh, um, the statues, it, it was felt, would be better donated by the city of Baltimore to the Chancellorville battlefield, which is where uh, both generals uh, had, had been there. That was where Jackson uh, died, or died as a result of wounds there. Uh, so the statues are at the Chancellorsville battlefield now. But look at how, look at the size of them and the hoist that Laura has to be on uh, to be working on the statues. She was so meticulous with this, uh, she wanted to get the exact look that the generals had during the Civil War times. And she was able to track down a coat that Stonewall Jackson had owned and wore, a military coat. And she wanted to know what the buttons looked like. So she was able to persuade uh, the archivist or uh, uh, collector or whatever who had Jackson's jacket uh, to let her have a look at, at it for the buttons. And she modeled the buttons and everything else from the coat uh, exactly in the statue. Here's uh, uh, some of her thoughts on having done that. Hard work, horses. She loved horses. She, many of her medals and sculptures have, sculptures have to do with horses. Research and imagination went into the statues and 12 years of my life. A sculptor's life is measured in large chunks of time. A statue like the Lee and Jackson becomes part of you. It's like having a child. Of course, there's no satisfaction quite like that of a beautifully complete and acceptable creation. And she knew she'd done that. And here's a, a second thought. Jimmy liked my Lee and Jackson. That was enough. Good for you, Laura. Uh, here's one of the uh, things she was commissioned for, a, a chaplain's medal showing a World War I chaplain uh, giving a drink to a wounded soldier, apparently a bullet hole in his back there, uh, who may or may not survive. But that was awarded to all uh, surviving chaplains uh, after World War I. Uh, she did this medal honoring Lindbergh. I have a copy of this. Uh, they were made available in bronze, uh, really uh, several million. Uh, some are, I, I got mine off eBay a few years ago, uh, and I think they're still out there. Uh, here's uh, Lindbergh as he looked. It was a medal uh, uh, that Congress had uh, legislated past. I, and I've never been able to find out. Here's obviously the Lone Eagle, which was Lindbergh's nickname. Uh, soaring over the Atlantic. And I, what I don't know is whether Lindbergh got that nickname 
because of this metal and Laura's design, or whether Laura took the design based on the nickname. I'm not sure which it was. <laughs> Don't know at all. Uh, but it's it's very cool. Uh, here's uh, her first numismatic design, uh, which was the Alabama commemorative half dollar. Um, and this one, excuse me, I'm going to turn off my phone. Um, this was the 1919 Alabama commemorative half dollar, which Laura then became, she was the first woman uh, to be granted a design for a U.S. coin. Um, this was uh, uh, pretty revolutionary uh, during this male uh, chauvinistic era, but it won't be the last time for her uh, with commemoratives. Here's the second one, uh, Grant, uh, the 22, 1922 silver Grant commemorative half and the $22 uh, uh, $1 uh, grant coin. Um, artists have commented on how what a wonderful job she did in particular with the leaves on a relatively small coin and the detail involved in that. And obviously the picture of Grant, that's, that's the guy that uh, uh, we know and the image that we know uh, representing uh, the uh, general who uh, helped bring about a conclusion. Uh, to the Civil War. Here's another one, uh, the 1925 Vancouver uh, commemorative half, uh, which Laura designed. Uh, commemorative half dollars are interesting, as I think a lot of you know. Uh, the classic commemoratives are all cool and historic. Lots of abuse uh, as far as uh, um, the, the things commemorated in many instances, you know, Elgin, Illinois, York County, Maine. Uh, not exactly uh, uh, highlights, uh, but it was easy to get a, get your congressman uh, to introduce a bill to Congress, uh, get your senator to, to co-sponsor, uh, get it passed through Congress. They'd help one another out with that uh, uh, through the commemorative era uh, and then get the president to sign it. And uh, when you when 25,000 or whatever your number was uh, were um, made by the mint, if they didn't sell uh, and you're the commission trying to get money for Fort Vancouver or whatever, uh, you can send them back to the men at face value. So you can charge what you want to sell them to collectors and the public and then any leftovers back to the mint. Uh, this led to obviously uh, some abuses before uh, it was the commemorative, classic commemorative era was uh, brought to a halt. This is the, the just the greatest. And this is one of two collaborations uh, in commemoratives. Um, um, Simpson and um, William Macy Simpson and his wife uh, designed, co-designed or worked together on uh, the Roanoke Commem. Um, but this one is classic and generally regarded as the, the most beautiful of the classic Commems. Laura's design is the Indian holding up his hand, trying to stop the wagon train. And if you look behind the Indian, you can see along the path of the Oregon Trail the covered wagons as uh, um, white settlers are moving west, further and further west pressuring the Indian. Uh, James did the reverse design showing one of those wagons on the move. Uh, Jimmy always liked, when he could, liked to do uh, motion and that's implied in the design uh, of his covered wagon here. This was a great design uh, that Laura did uh, in and submitted uh, when uh, it was de desired uh, to um, commemorate uh, the uh, 200th anniversary of, of George Washington's birth with the Washington Quarter. Um, her design was advanced to Andrew Mellon, Secretary of the Treasury, as the winner of the competition, but Mellon had say as to which design he would pick. Now, sometimes people, I've heard people say, oh, well, it must have been male chauvinism that kept Laura from getting this incredible design on the quarter. But Andrew Mellon was the same guy who had approved her Alabama, her Vancouver, her Grant. Uh, it, it, it's hard to imagine uh, that Mellon had anything uh, against her as a woman, per se. He favored Flanagan with Flanagan's design Either, this is speculation on my part, either out of political pressure, uh, if Flanagan had some uh, high, 
high powered friends, or possibly Flanagan had never designed a coin before. Mellon might have thought, well, if, if this guy gets a start, he may do some others for, for us. Well, Flanagan never did any others, and we had the have had the Washington Flanagan's Washington Quarter for a long time. But this design of Laura's, which is tremendous, reappeared on the 1999 Washington Gold Commemorative, uh, commemorating uh, uh, the uh, uh, 200th anniversary of Washington's death. Uh, she did one for the Philippines. Uh, and there's an interesting story here. The design you see is not uh, what Laura uh, submitted to the Mint and fought incredibly hard to maintain. She wanted a high relief, sort of a bowl shaped design with MacArthur's portrait and his hat and so on in strong high relief. Now, if you take a look at uh, at Washington, or sorry, at, at MacArthur's uh, cap, especially the bill of it, uh, where it's along his head, it's the relief is pretty flat. The conflict came down to uh, technocrats at the Mint who did not want to do another high relief after having lots of dyes break, uh, et cetera, with the 1907 high relief St. Gaudens 20, and also with the 1921 peace dollar. They weren't interested in, in production problems. And who's going to win out? Laura, the artist with a high relief design, or the guys uh, at the Mint who are responsible for making these things? Well, you can see who won out. Uh, it's a relatively flat relief on the uh, 50 centavos or half peso, and also the peso coin that she did commissioned by the Philippines and then made by the US Mint. This was that uh, freeze that I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the panel that was commissioned to uh, uh, Jimmy. Uh, but uh, that Laura finished off. It's it's James Earl Frazier all the way with its theme. Uh, the Oklahoma land rush, you know, when the gun was fired uh, and th those who weren't Sooners as Oklahomans are called today, uh, who were following the rules that were at the starting line, then galloped off uh, to find choice uh, parcels of land uh, to stake out so they could homestead them. Well, the Sooners had gone out, you know, a day or two or three before uh, and uh, camped out overnight or whatever and uh, got some of the choice locations near uh, uh, rivers or what have you. Uh, but the motion that's shown in this in incredible work of Jimmy's that Laura polished up um, after his death uh, is just, it, it's a typical uh, James Earl Frazier piece. Now we come to James. Uh, born in uh, 1876, uh, died in 1953. He grew up in South Dakota. His dad was a railroad man. Uh, so he ended up moving around somewhat, but especially in South Dakota, he had exposure to Native Americans or American Indians uh, with whom he sympathized and he was influenced uh, by them. Uh, he, had, he wrote at one point of um, talking with an old trapper uh, from uh, the 19th century, uh, who said, yeah, those, those Indians, we, we just keep pushing them west. They're, we're going to end up pushing them into the Pacific Ocean. And uh, that Jim, Jimmy, in effect, quoted uh, that trapper, and it pretty much came to pass, uh, as that uh, old trapper had uh, projected. Well, Jimmy, uh, he went to school. He also I had art in, in him and knew it had to come out. We'll, we'll see a quotation from him in a bit about how he got his start. But he, he went to the Art Institute in Chicago. Then as great talents did at the turn of the 19th, early 20th century, he ended up in Paris. Uh, he came back and was an assistant to Augustus St. Gaudens, and it doesn't get any better than that. St. Gaudens was the premier sculptor of the late 19th century. All right, here we are where he, his path and Laura, Laura's path cross. He was a teacher and director of the Art Students League in New York. He met, he instructed, worked with uh, Laura, fell in love with her and married her in 1913. He's probably most famous to the general public for his statue, End of the Trail, and we'll see that a lot. Um, you're probably familiar with it. The Indian holding his war lance slumped over on his pony as he realizes his way of life 
uh, has come to an end. And as the old trapper put it, he's likely to get pushed into the Pacific Ocean. He started to model that as early as 1894. He finished a three times life size version of it uh, for the 1915 PANPAC International Exposition. Uh, Jimmy had all kinds of ability with heroic sculptures as well. He did many commission medals and coin designs. We saw the uh, covered wagon on the Oregon uh, Kamem, and we're going to see the famous, as it's called, the Buffalo Nickel pretty soon. Here, this is from Laura. He was a great teacher, Laura recalled. Jimmy had the rare quality of being able to recognize what someone felt. He never liked to work in one specific manner. He encouraged individualism. Everyone loved him, especially me. Yeah, that was from her diary. <laughs> His friend Barry Faulkner described him as follows. His character was like a good piece of scotch tweed, handsome, durable, and warm. Here's uh, Jimmy about his start. He's posing next to a gigantic uh, sculpture he did of Lincoln, uh, which was to be placed at the start of the New, New Jersey Turnpike uh, when it was created. Uh, it's still there as far as I know. But here's what Jimmy said. Father was not sure that I should study art. He thought I might be a failure. So he sought the advice of his friend, Sir William Van Horn, who was an artist and art connoisseur. I was asked to bring my photographs and drawings so that he might judge them. I shall always be thankful to him, for he approved my studying art. I then found myself on an ocean liner sailing for France and to schools in Paris. And that was the beginning of Jimmy's path uh, that God had laid out for him. This is the story of Jimmy's life too. Art comes to you, proposing frankly to give you nothing but the highest quality to your moments as they pass. Jimmy and Laura both lived their life uh, expressing uh, their talent and their art and experiencing the highest quality uh, throughout their lives as, as they did so. Look at the size of this, of this thing. Uh, it's, it's at the, uh, the bridge uh, going over the, the river in Washington, going over the river to, to Arlington. To accomplish great things, we must not only act, but also dream not only plan, but also believe that you can make your dreams reality. And here's Jimmy making his dream reality uh, for all of us. He was commemorated on a stamp uh, in, the, um, uh, in 1953, the year he died. Uh, the, this shows the freeze that Frazier did that's on the Supreme Court building in Washington. He's got various gigantic uh, sculptures. Uh, in Washington. We'll see at least one other. Here's end of the trail. The Indians with his lance slumped over on his pony. Even the pony looks sad. <laughs> uh, when when you, you'll see this from a couple of angles. Uh, it, it's so famous. Uh, Jimmy, as a, a young guy starting out, didn't copyright end of the trail. Big mistake. He never made a penny off end of the trail, but millions of his image end of the trail have been taken so, and other people have had no problem making money off Jimmy's image. This is the, uh, it was a contemporary bronze. Uh, uh, this guy Schaller in my home state of Wisconsin was an industrialist uh, who was also kind of a, he wasn't a sculptor on the level of Jimmy or Laura. Uh, you know, if it's baseball, he's probably like class A minor leagues, uh, while uh, um, Jimmy and Laura in sculpture are in the hall of the baseball hall of fame, uh, to use that, that metaphor. But because uh, Schaller and Jimmy were close uh, as uh, colleagues, work as sculptors, um, uh, Schaller, who had a lot of money, said, geez, that, that end of the trail, I want to have one uh, for the park I'm going to create in my hometown of Waupon, Wisconsin, which is uh, kind of uh, central, a uh, little north of Madison uh, and west of Milwaukee. Uh, so to this day, uh, this full-sized uh, bronze 
uh, that Jimmy authorized be created or did create for Schaller uh, is in Waupon, Wisconsin. Here's his Pony Express medal. Uh, that wagon looks very much like the one that's on the Oregon Trail. But here's the Pony Express rider being pursued by uh, Native Americans, by Indians who want to kill him, and he's shooting back. But here's the motion that is often in Jimmy's work as the horse is galloping away and the Pony Express rider is uh, shooting back at the Indians, uh, trying to get away from him and save his life. Oh, yeah, he designed the World War I victory medal. All 5 million U.S. military who'd taken part in World War I got one of these. Uh, and it, it's one of his many great designs. Here's the Naval Cross, which is the second highest Naval Award to the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, and uh, Jimmy, Jim, Jimmy's reputation was made in large part by end of the trail at the uh, 1915 Pan Pack Expo. And his career took off after that, as you can see from the dates on uh, the, the medals and his works uh, succeeding end of the, the trail. Here's one of the uh, one of Jimmy's that's also in front of the Supreme Court uh, holding Lex is Latin for law. Uh, here's the guardian of the law with his, his sword behind him. Uh, you know, neoclassical uh, emphasis uh, looking very uh, Roman, uh, but uh, um, standing there uh, in front of the, or sitting there in front of the Supreme Court, uh, standing firm uh, to protect uh, law in the United States of America. Uh, here's, uh, this is above the National Archives, this tableau also uh, neoclassical uh, and, and a great work. I mean, the, these people were just so active their entire lives, um, fulf fulfilling themselves and leaving a heritage of art for all of America. Uh, he did this of Patton, uh, which is at the West Point Military Academy. And that, that's the look of, of George Patton, uh, who uh, stormed across Europe in World War II with considerable success. Uh, here's the arts of peace. And uh, this is, uh, these are the two that are uh, at the bridge uh, that goes over to Arlington. Uh, these were the last major works that he completed before he died in 1953, uh, the Patton Monument. Uh, and these two are, are among, are pretty much the last that he finished. And again, Laura finished off the, uh, the Oklahoma land rush uh, freeze. He did the, this as, it's not quite a coin, <clears throat> Congress authorized this as a medal rather than, than a coin, the Norse American, you know, thins and thicks. Uh, but there's Jimmy's design uh, for it, authorized by the Congress of the United States of America, uh, estimate uh, AD uh, 1000 for uh, the, uh, the Viking or the Norse um, visits to North America, uh, which had been well established uh, uh, centuries before Columbus. Uh, we come to the immortal buffalo nickel, uh, which uh, it, it, it's just iconic. Um, Jimmy used three different Indians for as the model for the Indian. He didn't want to choose just one where it would look like one particular tribe. Uh, he ended up with Iron Tail, who was a Lakota, uh, Sioux, if you will. Um, uh, two Moons, a Cheyenne, and Big Tree, a Kiowa. And he took features from the three of them uh, to make this composite of a Plains Indian, which would represent America um, better, he felt, than anything else. That it was, this was what America uh, was uh, through much of its time. On the reverse, we find the bison or the buffalo. Uh, and uh, uh, just a comment, and um, Q. David Bowers uh, and figured this out. Uh, it's often said that the, the buffalo on the back is Black Diamond, uh, who was a buffalo at the uh, Central Park Zoo uh, in New York. Uh, Jimmy never went to the Central Park Zoo when he wanted to, to get the model of a bison. He knew what they looked like, of course, but he wanted one specific. He went to the Bronx Zoo, where the leader of the herd 
was a bison that had been given the name Bronx. Uh, and Jimmy spent an afternoon trying to get every time Jimmy, Jimmy wanted this side profile of the buffalo bull. And every time Jimmy would move, Bronx would move so that he was facing Jimmy. He knew Jimmy was up to something and he wasn't going to tolerate uh, turning sideways to Jimmy, at least for a long time. Jimmy spent some hours there and wrote about that, about how frustrating it was waiting for the, the, <laughs> the dang uh, buffalo to turn to the side so he could get a view of it. Now, how, how, do, how did Q. David Bowers figure out that this was not Black Diamond, other than the fact that, uh, that Black Diamond never left the Central Park Zoo and Jimmy never went there? The horns. Uh, the head of the real Black Diamond, Black Diamond was slaughtered in 1915, uh, got 750 pounds or so of uh, uh, usable meat from him, sold at two bucks a pound, which was a lot uh, in 1915. But the head was preserved and it still exists. And if you look at the head of Black Diamond, when he has his head in the same pose as the nickel with his nose pointed straight to the ground, Black Diamond's horns go straight up. There's no curve to them, as you see in this model here. Uh, Bronx must have had a curve to his horn. Jimmy would not have misrendered uh, a straight horn as a curved horn. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, one of the third party grading services uh, got a lot of publicity uh, over using the name Black Diamond and Blossom. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's a, a common mythology that uh, the bison used was Black Diamond, but no, it was bison. <laughs> it was Bronx. Here's Laura uh, speaking um, on the life she shared with Jimmy for, from her diary. Jimmy and I simply wore ourselves out working. We were incapable of resisting a challenge during our allotted three score and 10. Our bodies were never able to keep up with our minds nor the insatiable desire that possessed us to create something bigger and more beautiful for America. Why did they do this? They did this because they had art in them that had to come out and they had talents. But as Laura says, they wanted to create something bigger and more beautiful for America, for America then and for all of us now and for all Americans in the future. Well, the candle of understanding uh, mentioned uh, biblically uh, won't be put out. That was the understanding that both of them had, that they were put on this earth for their talent uh, to be expressed, yes, but to make something bigger and more beautiful for America and for that matter, the entire world. Here's their studio. Uh, they each shared half of it. And Jimmy was, Laura commented on this more than once. He never interfered with her work. If she went to him and showed him what she was doing and asked him for commentary, he'd provide it. But he would not tell her what to do. He stayed on his half of the studio and did express his art and his dream and his genius while she was doing the same thing on the other side. And uh, this, this always moved me. Uh, Laura recorded how uh, basically their day would start at like 10 in the morning because they'd work until typically midnight or so. They, they just were on fire uh, every day of their lives to be working, 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 expressing. Well, fine, uh, when it got to be you know, midnight or so at night, uh, and they'd walk back uh, 200 yards or so uh, from the studio to their house. Sometimes they were quiet, uh, not saying anything to one another. Sometimes they're saying, you know, well, how'd you do today? What do you got planned for tomorrow? And they'd discuss it. But every time they went, they were holding hands, walking together in love, listening to the peepers in the pond and the hoot owls uh, at midnight uh, and heading, heading back uh, to have a well-deserved night's rest, uh, get up late, have a breakfast, take a sandwich over, uh, and then head to the studio for another day of fulfillment, together and yet separately together, if that makes any sense. This was neat also. Uh, this was Laura speaking about their relationship, but also on Jimmy's death. Two soul, and this describes him perfectly, two souls with but a single thought 
art, art themselves, leave, making something beautiful and big for America. Two, two souls with but a single thought, two hearts that beat as one. We talked and laughed and competed all our lives. When we weren't working, we were talking. We never grew tired of each other or ran out of subject matter to discuss or to argue about. We could spend literally days discussing a play or a concert. Good acting always thrilled us, as did the strength and beauty of poetic writing. Of course, our own creative work was our life. I added that emphasis. It was that way to the end. A few minutes before Jimmy passed away, I sat on the edge of his bed and started talking about us doing a Lincoln. He just beamed with excitement. I didn't want him to overexert himself, so I thought I better leave. I got up and walked to the door, uh, then turned around and looked at Jimmy. He raised his head, nodded, and looked at me, smiled and said, by golly, Laura. We'll do a colossal Lincoln together. Those were the last words James Earl Frazier spoke. He died minutes later. You know, this is way above my pay grade, but I, I guess I hope that wherever they are now, that they've been given a Mount Everest sized block of marble and the real Lincoln to pose for them any way they want and an eternity for them to be able to do a colossal Lincoln together. That would just be my wish for what it's worth. Nothing shall part us in our love until Thanatos, who was the ancient God, Greek God of death, at his appointed hour removed us from the light of day. Jimmy removed from the light of day, 1953. Laura, 1966 from a stroke. Uh, but what great, incredible talents uh, what new, great numismatic works they left us, the Buffalo Nickel, Laura's Commems, the 1999 design that she had uh, posed for, uh, proposed for the uh, Washington Quarter, and all the sorts of works, uh, some of the hundreds of works that each of them created uh, to express and fulfill their genius and their talent and to create something bigger and, and better and more beautiful for America. And they did, they did in everything that they did. This is strange, but uh, obviously I never met them, either one of them. But after, especially after having been able to go through their personal papers and, and Laura's diaries in particular, I feel I got to know her better than Jimmy who left fewer uh, personal glimpses behind. But I regard these two people as my friends. And I hope folks, that in the course of this presentation, with what you've seen and heard and learned about these two people, my hope is that these two people are your friends as well. And that's the conclusion to my uh, presentation for you. And I'm very thankful to you and to Paula and to the ANA for allowing me to, to do it. Thank you, everyone. Oh, my goodness, Paul, wow, that was so sweet. What a lovely story. No argument. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. And then if anybody has any questions or comments, um, you can pop those in the Q&A in the chat. I'll just give you just a couple seconds there to get that in there. Um, or if you just want to tell Bob how great that was, that was so, that was just a great, uh, it had everything in it, everything you needed in a story. So thank you, Bob. Um, we oh. will have, we do have more, um, e-learning programs coming so please be sure you're checking the website and your email we'll start sending out some email blasts with um, things that are of interest to you if you are a member um, and I don't see any questions so Bob I'm just going to say thanks again and um, I hope you have everybody has a great day <laughs>